Hello there, I'm Mike Flanagan, and today Spooky Astronauts, who's one of my favorite reviewers, is going to be ranking my films by order of personal favorite. Hi friends, as Mike just said, today I'm having a detailed look at Mike Flanagan's work and I'll be presenting this in order of a personal ranking. I say personal because I will convince you in this video that Mike Flanagan's certain style is quite sentimental and romantic. Taking horrific situations and presenting them as ghosts haunting us all. So it's understandable that everyone's connections to these ghosts will be different. I'll also be talking about the films so minor spoiler alert but I'm not going to hit on any big plot points or give away any reveals. I'm going to be talking about the work as a whole so don't worry too much about that. I promise if anything this is probably going to inspire you to revisit some of his work or watch the films that you haven't seen yet because that's why we're here. We're here to celebrate Mike's work and his distinctive storytelling style. It's important to acknowledge that Mike isn't just a director but he's also a writer and an editor. Literally these projects are in his hands from pre-production all the way through to the final stages. And yes, if you're wondering, Mike will be joining us throughout this video to give us some exclusive information and background on some of his films and of course, TV shows. So trust me, you'll want to watch this one all the way through. So let's get started. Mike Flanagan was born in Salem, Massachusetts, and although his family moved around a lot, he only lived in Salem for a brief time, but it left an impact on him. He was fascinated with the Salem witch trials and of course, ghost stories. Mike went on to attend at university, graduating with a degree in electronic media and film with a minor in theater. Mike's early projects, although rough, show roots of his stylization. These films more lend into drama, so I won't be ranking them in this video, but I do want to mention The Ghosts of Hamilton Street because I think it's very important. Ghosts of Hamilton Street is the story of a man who starts to have people in his life vanish in the order of when he met them. And on top of of that he's the only one who can remember them existing so he is left to evaluate who made the most impact on his life. Although this film is rough and at times confusing, the film has a unique and creative concept. When these people in his life start to disappear, his life starts to slowly fall apart, shedding a light on really what makes up his life and what's important to him. Ghosts of Hamilton Street is very interesting because it shows the first glimmer of really what I believe makes up Mike Flanagan's whole distinctive style, and that is a ghost, a haunting, and what that really can mean. It's not always an apparition, it's not always a spirit, it can be an overwhelming feeling, thought, or even an event you're unable to shake. It's something that is so strong, it feels like a presence that is always with you, and it's something you're unable to let go of. Mike's other work before his first feature includes Make Believe, a drama about four college students who are working on a production of Romeo and Juliet. Still Life, a drama about a group of photography students who after capturing a troubling encounter on camera are inspired to take vulnerable photos of those around them. And of course, the short Oculus chapter three, The Man with the Plan, which later inspired the film Oculus. I highly recommend you check out this short, but more on that later. Now we need to start the ranking and I'm starting with my least favorite and I'll go to my absolute favorite project of his at the very end. And I say least favorite and most favorite because spoiler alert, I like all of his work. It's all very unique, but has this overwhelming theme that I really enjoy, um, that I think he presents really well because somehow no matter what source material, he's able to put a fresh spin on things and really make you see things from the other side, literally. Ghosts, I'm talking about ghosts. <laughs> so let's start with my least favorite, which is Ouija, The Origin of Evil. Origin of Evil is of course the prequel to the 2014 film Ouija, which had a different director and was very poorly received. The film is about a group of teenagers who try to make contact with one of their friends who recently passed away, but unfortunately they make contact with the wrong spirit. In this film, there is a backstory given to the evil entity that involves two girls and their mother. Although the setup is intriguing, unfortunately this is an extremely messy film that relies on horror 
tropes and a messy plot that drops the tension several times. So horror fans did not expect much when they heard there was a prequel coming out. But this was one of the rare times where the sequel, or in this case, even the prequel, was better than the original, and the votes don't lie. Mike took the evil spirits from the first film and gave them a solid backstory. Starring Lulu Wilson and some reoccurring actors that you'll notice throughout Mike's work, including Annalise Basso, Elizabeth Resner, and Henry Thomas. Oh, and I'm gonna give out a couple of gold stars during this video, so first gold star goes to anyone who recognized Mike's wife, Kate Siegel, who has a small role at the start of this film. The film takes takes place in 1976 LA, where a widowed mother must provide for her two daughters, and in doing so, she runs a psychic scam out of her home. But when the oldest daughter gets into some mischief playing with a Ouija board, it gives the mother the inspiration to add it as a prop to her act. But in doing so, it allows her youngest daughter's vulnerability to be taken advantage of by the dead. Lulu Wilson is delightfully terrifying in this film. The effect of her literally channeling the spirits is something that makes this film so unique. Mike took the source material and put his flair on it. Somehow the story they rushed in the original film became a delicate yet terrifying, heart-wrenching story about loss and family. And Mike wasn't scared to make drastic changes to the origin story that redefined what the first one was. I mean, are we meant to believe Faso grows up to be Lynn Shay? But hey, we got a solid Good Haunting film that stands alone away from the original. We also got to see a glimpse of one of Mike's trademarks. Even though this film is a few projects in, in his timeline of work, we see a mirror wedged in the back of this scene. This is the mirror from his film Oculus, and Mike loves to hide it in his other films. We'll talk about that movie shortly. I also really want to believe that this scene here is a throw to The Exorcist 3. In 2010, a Kickstarter was created for Absentia, promising to be a rare, one-of-a-kind film that focuses on what you don't see and psychological elements. And indeed, the film delivered. I don't think I've ever seen so much praise, and I'm not joking, for an indie film like this. I always have people talking to me about this film and people love it. What some of you may not know is Absentia was actually Mike Flanagan's first feature horror, but it was also his last effort at getting his foot in the door of the industry. I asked Mike Flanagan about this. So Absentia was different than you know any other production in my career, mostly because um, I had no money at all. Um, it was a last ditch effort really to try to get a foothold in the industry um, when, at a time when I really felt like I, I wasn't going to make it. I wasn't going to, to be able to, to make movies for a living. Um, and so Absentia we made with no lights, um, no, uh, no crew really, there, there were about eight of us. We shot it in my apartment in Glendale, California um, over the course of about 15 days. Um, and we raised the, the money for it on Kickstarter. So it's, it's a DIY independent film in, in every possible way. Uh, and it really was kind of that last Hail Mary pass to try to get something started. And um, somehow it, it, it worked. Raising what he did from Kickstarter and from funds of his own, Mike was able to create a film that really did exceed any financial constraints of production. It was not polished, it used basic framing and notable handheld shots, but horror fans were hooked because of the story that Kickstarter promised. It was his ability to combine fleshed out realistic characters with a thought provoking story. Part of me can't help but reflect on how this uses the same elements of time and space just like the ghosts of Hamilton Street. Absentia is a drama horror mystery about a woman and her sister who together try and find out the truth behind her husband's disappearance. They begin to find patterns that point 
to a dark and creepy tunnel. The movie draws in the audience with its complex characters battling deep issues such as substance abuse and of course grief. Believe it or not, this film is loosely based on the story of the three Billy Goats Gruff, a story about three goats that encounter a troll living under a bridge. But in this one, it's people who discover something sinister in a tunnel. The film really does rely on the audience's empathy of the characters and especially Katie Parker who carries us through the emotions, including laughter with this iconic line. Great. I'm gonna shower. I smell like an armpit's asshole. Nice to meet. If you're wondering why she might seem familiar, the film was made with a bunch of Mike's struggling filmmaker friends, Katie being one. Since then, Mike has casted her and other actors in this production in several of his projects. One good example is Perdita from Bly Manor. Also, fun fact, Mike's brother is also in this film. Carrying with Mike's familiar themes, the film gives another representation of a haunting, the ghosts of our past interacting with our current lives, holding us back from moving on. The film went on to win 14 awards and really put Mike on the map. Absentia was released direct to video but also spent some time on Netflix, which boosted its popularity. If you haven't seen this one, it is definitely worth watching. You saw the comments before, and although it is very raw, it's great to see where he came from, and it really does show that money is not a restraint when it comes to good, compelling story. Also, another gold star if you saw this, but if you haven't yet, keep an eye out for the 23 minute mark, where you can see the original Oculus mirror that was in the short film film. Hush is a 2016 horror thriller written by Mike Flanagan and his partner Kate Siegel, with Mike directing the film and Kate starring as Maddie, a deaf mute writer who lives isolated in the woods while attempting to work on a project. But her isolation proves dangerous when she becomes the target of a masked man. Hush really came about because of Kate Siegel. Um, we were we had we were dating at the time. We'd gone on a on a dinner date, and we're talking about movies that we really liked and the kind of projects we'd love to be able to work on someday. And we both mentioned um, Wait Until Dark as a thriller that we really loved, um, and thought that you know um, thought that that kind of film could be something that could be a, a wonderful challenge for her as a performer and for me as a director. And I I tend to lean a lot on dialogue in my work. I, I love monologues. I love when people talk. And so doing a film that completely removed that element from it, um, I thought was going to be a really f a fun challenge more than anything. Um, but Kate was really the driving force behind getting that story together. And um, it turned out to be this incredible collaboration between us that, that really, frankly, made us realize we wanted to get married. Um, that if we if we could kind of make it through that, uh, then we could make it through just about anything. That's perhaps the sweetest thing I've ever heard. And it does make sense because a lot of this film does not fit in with the other themes with Mike's portfolio. And it really does push him outside of his comfort zone and has him to rely on different techniques such as character blocking and of course physical fear not just psychological. This film only has 15 minutes of spoken dialogue and it joins not only the subgenre of home invasion but also sensory horror which includes films such as A Quiet Place, Bird Box and Don't Breathe. On top of having limited dialogue the film also takes place with minimal Minimal characters and in one single location. In an interview with BuzzFeed, Mike said that Kate and he worked on the script while blocking out the movements in their own home, looking for ways to enter the household and for props that could contribute to the storyline. He also wanted to build the tension with all of the scary moments in the film rather than just providing jump scares on cue, which gives the film more of a satisfying arc. It's also one of the only films where Mike doesn't explain the villain or his intentions, and there's also an Easter egg to pair with this idea. You can see here that Stephen King's book Mr. Mercedes is shown, which is also a story where the motives of the killer were never explained. Stephen King really liked Hush and he actually shouted it out on Twitter. The film was a simple yet straightforward cat and mouse horror that had some great payoffs and fight scenes. Although 
it does not have Mike's signature aspects. It does show his ability to step out of his comfort zone, straying from his typical stylization that works in his favor. And obviously it was a successful collaboration with his wife, but myself, I like a good haunting. <laughs> Oculus was meant to be Mike's initial horror feature, but he was denied creative control of how he wanted to tell the story. It's said that there were some big studios interested in the idea after seeing his short film, Oculus Chapter 3, The Man with the Plan. The short was directed by Mike and co-written by himself and Jeff Seidman. The 32 minute film follows a man who records himself talking about a haunted mirror while conducting an experiment in order to prove its power. I find this so interesting. Studios wanted to turn the film into a found footage, which makes complete sense with all of the cameras involved. But the short film was never shown as a found footage itself, but instead told as a story from a fly on the war perspective. As a found footage fan, I can't help but wonder what the film would have looked like if they had taken that route. Obviously it would be completely different and have a completely different vibe and tone, but it's just really interesting to think about how he was very much against that. The movie is technically based on the short, but if you watch the short, it's kind of an Easter egg because the man in the story talks about the story, which is the Oculus film. But the movie brings in a very complex story and moves beyond the mirror and one room. Oculus is about two siblings that encounter true evil when a haunted mirror is hung in their home. 11 years later, they return to try and prove what they experienced as children, but the mirror's power is stronger than ever, making them doubt their reality. The film takes place in two timelines, them as adults and as children. So the magic of pulling the story together was all thanks to the edit. Oculus is a very special movie to me just because it, it's like the first real movie that I got to make. And I don't know why people connect with it um, as much as they do. I'm just glad that they do. Um, you know, Oculus was a terrifying experience for me shooting it because um, I felt like I didn't really know what I was doing. And uh, I also felt like this could very well be my first and last kind of real movie. Um, so there, there was an awful lot of self-imposed pressure day to day to try to, to try to make something, to kind of leave everything on the field, to try to, to, try to throw everything I could think of at it. Um, and so I, I fell back on where I was the most confident when it came to making movies, which was editing. I was a professional editor at the time, um, mostly for reality TV shows. And so editing was where I felt at home and confident. And so the movie was kind of built around its edit. Um, the transitions between the two timelines and everything like that were basically built in there because I knew I could always fall back on on trying to do something ambitious editorially. Um, so it was a, a really phenomenal experience um, for me in that I really learned a lot about what it takes to really make a movie. Um, but it also, in a lot of ways, was kind of a trial by fire. And I'm just really grateful that it, that it connected. Um, our first distributor had actually um, abandoned the film after we finished it. Um, and so there was a period of time there when the movie was finished when I didn't know if anyone would ever see it. And we took it to Toronto, and that's where we, we got Relativity on board um, to release the film. But uh, for a minute there, it looked like it was kind of all for nothing. So I'm, I'm just very glad that it it made it out there in the world and that people enjoy it. The film starred Karen Gillian as Kaylee and Brenton Thwaite as her brother Tim. Young Tim was played by Garrett Ryan and young Kaylee was played by Annalise Basso who also starred in Ouija, Origin of Evil. Oculus shows us all the traits that we can now see as a clear pattern of Mike's work. The siblings aren't just haunted physically but they're haunted mentally with their past. In this film we also see a color palette that really carries through Mike's work where he loves these kind of jewel tones that are deep and rich, siding on blues and greens. And of course we have the ghostly woman and gold star if you realized who this was. In 2017 this film got a Bollywood adaption and Mike was credited as an executive producer. 
Speaking of adaptations, my next film in this ranking is Doctor Sleep, a film that had both Stephen King fans and Kubrick fans on the edge of their seat, wondering if it could be done. The Doctor Sleep screenplay was written by Mike, who directed and edited the film. And of course, it's based on the 2013 Stephen King novel of the same name, which is a sequel to the classic 1977 novel The Shining. The film starring Ewan McGregor follows Danny Torrance from The Shining, who is now a grown man dealing with his childhood trauma, but he must protect another child who also shines from an evil group known as the True Knot. The film also acts as a sequel to the Kubrick version of The Shining, which of course we all know that King greatly dislikes. How Mike was able to balance the King version and the Kubrick version is pretty outstanding, and he definitely honored the Kubrick version with his elaborate set. One of the biggest challenges and most exciting elements of being able to make Doctor Sleep was that we got to rebuild the Overlook Hotel um, and Kubrick's Overlook specifically. Uh, it was like being in a candy store for a cinephile. Um, Warner Brothers opened up the archives for us. We had access to Kubrick's production design plans and blueprints. We were able to try to approximate um, each set as he had built it, um, which turned out to come with its own unique set of challenges because he had built uh, his sets um, on stages in England and incorporated elements of the existing sound stages into his design. He also, it seems from, from what, I, what I could glean, looking at the, um, the film versus the blueprints, uh, made changes to it on the fly that weren't represented in his design. So we would be following the blueprint to the letter and then realize it didn't entirely 100% match what was in the movie. Um, so that was that was always a really cool discovery. Um, but it was really neat. It was it was like being able to forensically interrogate Kubrick on a lot of the choices that he made, and and to realize you know oh well he must he put the camera here um, on the staircase because of this symmetry that he achieved, or because of this really wonderful accident that that happens with the chandeliers when you move the camera this way. Um, but we got to try it out and say, well, what happened if he would have put it over here or over here? And it was a really neat way to kind of experience the genius of his filmmaking firsthand. Um, our priorities with it were to make the sets as, uh, as close a match as possible. And a, a lot of times that, that wasn't possible. A lot of times we couldn't get it just right or the particular fixtures or... Uh, the sinks or um, the wallpaper was just a little different or uh, the things he used were no longer made or available. And so we had to kind of get as close as we could. Um, but it, it remains one of the coolest things I've ever gotten to do um, just as a fan of movies was uh, ride. A, I rode a big wheel um, through the Overlook Hotel. And so did a lot of my cast and crew. And uh, we all turned into kids again. It's like walking through your own memories. It was a really, really unique and amazing experience. Mike always knew that the way to make the sequel was to honor both the King and the Kubrick version. He said in an interview with gizmondo.com that if King didn't agree to this, he wouldn't have made the film. He also said that it was an extremely stressful situation and he woke up every morning panicking, but he found if he didn't call it a direct sequel to The Shining and more of a descent of The Shining or a child of both King and Kubrick, it would make him feel better. He just wanted to honor both parents in a sense. But he's Hard work paid off and the film was received well by critics and many fans. Mike's ability to draw deep emotional attachment between his audience and his characters worked hand in hand with Stephen King's characters, which have always had a strong sense of self or are battling those demons standing in their way of their own truths. Which of course fits very well with Mike because he has plenty of experience with characters who are dealing with their own ghosts. It's hard to watch this one and not be overcome with excitement from both the nostalgia and the ability to balance two sides of the same coin. 
The Haunting of Bly Manor is Mike's second entry into the Haunting Anthology TV series. Bly Manor is the second season of the TV show, with the first series being The Haunting of Hill House, which was loosely based on the 1959 novel of the same name by Shirley Jackson. This season is based off the 1898 novella The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, but it also draws inspiration from other stories in his portfolio. The show had a great cast, including some actors we've seen in Mike's previous works. Season one and two share a lot of the same cast playing different characters. Each episode in the series is named after one of Henry James's ghost stories, but the overwhelming story of the TV show is The Turn of the Screw. The show is about a man who hires an American nanny to take care of his orphaned niece and nephew who live in a haunted estate called Bly Manor. Bly Manor is peak Flanagan. It's all about acceptance of one's past and how it haunts the people who can't move forward. It's a romantic gothic haunting that aims to equally break your heart and urge you to sleep with the light on. Mike is credited as being a creator of the series, but only directed the first episode. The first season of The Haunting is more about a family, and we will get there. But Bly Manor is a story that is more about mystery, love, and also how ghosts come to be. But also it flirts with the idea that every ghost has a story, no matter how scary they may appear, and the truth just might be lost. I'm sure those who have seen the series know I'm talking about episode eight. The Romance of Old Certain Clothes. Based on the story of the same name from Henry James and starring Kate Siegel, I think I've watched this episode alone five times. It's a timeless, tragic ghost story that holds the foundation of the whole series series together. It really is haunting in every way. Bly Manor wasn't created for those looking for a scare, but more for people who wanted a very well unraveled mystery. There's so many details, hidden symbols, and ghosts throughout the story, showing immaculate attention to detail. The show is for people who are wanting to explore different representations of hauntings, pushing the boundaries of what we believe to be the classic ghost story. Before I Wake really is Mike Flanagan's most overlooked production and I'll explain why shortly, but it's also the film that got me into Mike Flanagan and really had me looking out for his future work. It was an unexpected ride in which the viewers are led to believe that they're about to watch a supernatural horror, but come out with a heart-wrenching story about overcoming your own, I hate to be a broken record, but ghost. The fantasy horror drama stars Kate Bosworth, Thomas Jane, and Jacob Tremblay. The story is about a couple who adopts an orphan boy who can manifest his dreams as he sleeps. But in doing so, he also manifests his nightmares. Now his new family must find the source of his dreams in order to keep themselves and him safe. The film is a touching fantasy with some really great payoffs, including a soundtrack composed by Danny Elfman and the Newton brothers. Unfortunately, this film went under the radar because of distribution issues. The film was originally scheduled for release in 2015, and then it was pushed to 2016, and then it was taken taken off the schedule because the distribution company filed for bankruptcy. The film was finally released in 2016, but didn't have an American release until late 2017, really early 2018. It was then put on Netflix, but this was three years after the film had wrapped and there was no marketing for it. Before I Wake was a very special movie to me. It, it was originally called Somnia, which means dreams. And uh, it was always a challenge in that it, it was never really a horror film. It, it had horror elements, but there was something much more delicate and um, much more like a, a fairy tale or a bedtime story to it. And the, the emotional punch that the script packed w was always something very, very close to me and worth protecting. Um, you know, the, the movie itself, getting it financed and then getting it made was not easy. And one of the, the saving graces for the film was the casting of Jacob Tremblay. Um, and Jacob at the time uh, was an unknown. He uh, had yet to do Room. I think his biggest credit was a small part in the Smurfs part two. And we were looking at a lot of young actors and we found his tape, it was a self tape that he'd submitted and uh, it was just clear from the first few seconds of his tape that um, he, was, he was Cody. Uh, 
and that he was going to go on to a huge and, and phenomenally successful career. Um, we had finished the film, and um, then our distributor went bankrupt. And so for many years, that film wasn't released. And in the interim, Jacob went on to do Room and, and kind of become the most uh, recognizable and successful child actor in the business. Um, and we had this terrific performance of his, a very early performance that we couldn't release. And for a very long time, I thought that movie would never come out. Um, when it did finally come out, when Netflix rescued it, it came out to very little fanfare and was just kind of unceremoniously and quietly dumped onto the, the Netflix service. Um, that movie was always meant to be a theatrical release and always one that was really, really personal uh, to me and to everyone who worked on it. So um, I'll always kind of wonder what would have happened if that movie had gotten the release that, uh, that it should have. But um, I am very grateful to Netflix that they got it out there into the world at all. I was interested to learn that Mike Flanagan was against the idea of calling this a horror movie. But I feel like over the years he's come around to the idea of horror and how we do have an audience who do like and appreciate this kind of story. There is something so powerful about metaphors in horror and how it can create so much healing for the people who watch it. I think that this film still does hit close with many people and if you haven't seen it, Mike and I are tiptoeing around some big elements in this film because I would never want to give any spoilers for this film. It is so great. If you have not checked it out, I really do urge you to because it is the film that really got me onto Mike Flanagan's work and for a good reason. It is very unique um, and very well done. I really urge you to watch it and let me know what you think. Next, The Haunting of Hill House. This is the first of the anthology The Haunting that we spoke about a little bit earlier with every season being a different haunting with some reoccurring actors playing different roles. The first season is loosely based on the 1959 novel of the same name by Shirley Jackson. This season was created and directed by Mike with a board of writers for each episode. The Haunting of Hill House is the story of a family that experiences a horrific event in the home they grew up in. Years later, the children are now adults and they must come together to discover the truth of that night, confronting the ghosts in their memories and in their hearts. Researching a lot of Mike Flanagan this week, it's pretty obvious to me that this film calls back to where it all began with Oculus. It really has some of the same elements of the two timelines between them being kids and adults and also going back to the same place. It's just really interesting how different those projects are, but they also have such a similar theme. The show stars many of our favorite actors that have worked with Mike throughout the years, including Kate Siegel, Elizabeth Reza, Carla Gugino, Henry Thomas, and Lulu Wilson. Of course, like all great Flanagan productions, this story reveals the ghosts that are holding each of the characters back with detail and compassion. And Hill House is one of the more scary pieces of Mike's work. The funeral home featured in the show let him play with the idea of immediate death instead of the ghosts we leave behind. But that's kind of the idea of the story itself that plays into the fear of the unknown and how it may not be what it seems. And of course, our own demons getting in the way. It's said that the five siblings in the film represent the five stages of grief. And the way that the story weaves together all of the characters is really genius and it results in such a great payoff for the audience. Not only was the writing and characters complex, but so was the set itself. Each scene was carefully thought out, including hidden ghosts and symbols. Another gold star if you spotted the mirror from Oculus in episode one. But it was also designed with logistics in mind for its amazing cinematography and flowing shots. The Haunting of Hill House features some of my favorite production design, kind of, of anything I've gotten to work on. Um, the house itself, the interior of which was built on a stage in, in Atlanta, uh, was designed by Patricio Farrell, who I'd worked with before. And um, I, I love the inside of that house. It, it's, uh, it was designed to be an incredible and functional tool. It was, it was all designed so that we could execute the sixth episode of that show. So it was full of flyaway walls and hidden passageways um, ways that the crew and the actors could move around to accomplish those uh, single shot takes. Um, and the entire house was built both levels so that you could walk through all of Hill House uninterrupted instead of being broken up on multiple stages like a lot of these things are. 
Um, the other locations uh, that we found in Atlanta were kind of a mixed bag. We, we had a really beautiful exterior for the house, um, and that was in uh, LaGrange, Georgia. And uh, I, I loved loved that house. I've seen it now used in, in other things. It was recently in, in uh, Lovecraft Country, and I kind of jumped up when I saw it and said, hey, there's our house. Um, but yeah, The Haunting of Hill House uh, was a, a pretty brutal production and remains my least favorite production experience of, of, of all of them. But people love the show, so it was all worth it, I suppose. Um, but yeah, that, that was not a fun show to make by any stretch. And uh, I'm glad that it, that it resonates with people. I have to say, I would never have guessed that this was not a fun project to work on, but I do understand that weaving all of these stories and logistics together would have been very challenging. The series was very well received, being praised by Stephen King, who says that he thinks Shirley Jackson herself would approve, and Tarantino, who said, hands down, it's his favorite Netflix series. The series really showcases all of the aspects we have explored in this video that Mike was able to take from his his very first productions. He doesn't play within the dynamic rules of being a ghost because he creates the stories himself, so he allows himself to push those boundaries. There's no real restrictive definition of a haunting and he isn't afraid to play around with that. And the audience lapped it up. It's a classic gothic ghost story, but with all new boundaries. The show is incredibly moving and there's no surprise it ended up so high on my list. The way it all comes together in the end is something that is just magical and this leaves me with one production left to talk about today. I knew as this list went on and on I would get more and more sentimental because as I've mentioned Mike has this knack for ripping out these really heart-wrenching, emotional, and vulnerable stories and attaching them to horror movies or TV shows. And I can't tell you how completely shocked I was after watching Gerald's Game. It was one of my favorite books ever growing up in my teenage years. It was the only book I've ever experienced not being able to put down. I was just so enthralled in it and the tension is just unbelievable. I'm not a big book person. Obviously, I'm a huge film fan foremost. So this one, it just really shook me and I could not believe that they turned it into what it became. I'm still shocked. <laughs> the book itself had such a powerful story that held so much tension and I could not understand how they would turn this into a movie. And Mike apparently felt the same. Gerald's Game was a dream project of mine for a lot of years. I About half my life, actually, at the time when I made it. Um, I had read the novel uh, when I was in college and really fallen in love with it. I, I thought it, I'd never seen anything like it. It, it struck me as, as being so tense and intimate and um, such, a, such a remarkable challenge. I, I thought it was of Stephen King's work kind of the most unfilmable thing that he'd ever written, maybe except for, uh, for The Long Walk. But um, uh, so, so yeah, everything about it was a challenge, mostly getting anyone to agree to finance it. And um, I knew for a long time I wanted to try um, just because the story had been so impactful to me when I'd read it. And I thought Jesse was such a remarkable and fascinating heroine. And the challenge of trying to stage an entire film based on the inner monologue of a protagonist who's completely immobilized. Um, I, I thought that was just a, a challenge I couldn't resist. And um, uh, that movie will always be very special to me because um, I still to this day can't believe they let us make it. Um, but Carla Gugino you know, carried us on her back uh, to, to make that movie what it is. And um, it's some of the most incredible acting I've ever, I've ever uh, had the privilege to, to see in person. Um, it's a shame that we uh, had to choose one take of a lot of her work to show you in the movie because uh, just watching her do that every day um, was, was truly remarkable. And um, uh, yeah, I, 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 hope, I hope people enjoy it. 
Mike has confirmed that he carried around this book to all of his general meetings. If he was ever asked what his dream project was, he would pull out the book and try and pitch it. But if you know the story, apparently the pitches wouldn't last long because no one thought it was possible. So he usually only had 30 seconds. Gerald's Game is based on the 1992 novel by Stephen King. The book and the movie take place primarily in one location. The film is about a woman who travels to a lake house with her husband for a getaway to work on their marriage. But after an unexpected incident, the woman, Jessie, is left handcuffed to the bedpost, unable to call for help. Trapped in the room, she must plot her escape while fending off her personal demons. It's always a challenge to hold tension in these claustrophobic horror films that are led by one actor's performance. As Mike mentioned, Carla Gugino was harrowing as the lead. The film incorporates flashbacks that reveal her inner demons, in which Chiara Aurelia plays a younger version of herself. You might recognize her from Cruel Summer, Tell Me Your Secrets, and part two of Fear Street. Her parents and these flashbacks are played by none other other than Henry Thomas, who was unnerving, and Kate Siegel. The film is a chilling look at facing your own demons head on, which works directly into Flanagan's stylization of thoughtful characters haunted by their past. It's a chilling watch with a powerful conclusion that really does stick with you. And interesting enough, the film used minimal soundtrack. This creates the feeling of realism and the events that unfold being terrifyingly unescapable. Somehow this film is able to have you on the edge of the seat, although most of the games are psychological. This is a story and a film now that I hold very close to my heart and it's my favorite of Mike Flanagan's projects. And my last gold star goes to anyone who noticed the bed's headboard, which is the mirror from Oculus. It follows us everywhere. It's been a pleasure looking over Mike Flanagan's work and really understanding his style and themes. It's a very strong theme when you look at his body of work, I'm sure you can agree. So of course, naturally, I had to ask him about hauntings because I never get the option to ask film Makers about their intent and it was killing me. I had to know why Mike Flanagan was so obsessed with hauntings. Hauntings of the past, hauntings of yourself and your inner demons getting in the way. We see a lot of themes of substance abuse. We also see people haunted by events that have happened to them. But overall, everyone is haunted by some kind of presence in their life. And I really wanted to take this opportunity to ask him what was the deal with his hauntings and his obsession with the haunted? Um, people ask me over the years why I'm apparently fascinated with hauntings, and there's no easy answer to that. Um, you know, part of it is that I feel somewhat haunted in my own life. Um, I, I feel like we accumulate ghosts as we make our way through the world, and relationships that end or in people who come in and out of our lives um, that, you know, our, our basic memories, even our most pleasant and precious memories are our own haunted houses and we're building them in our, in our minds. We kind of walk through them and dance through them and, and if we're not careful, we can get lost there. Um, I'll always be fascinated by it, I think, because... Uh, because ghost stories are really just stories of things we've left behind that are different to us now on the other side of them. And they can take so many different forms. They're, they're just so malleable. Um, they're always gonna be relevant. They're always gonna be able to be made fresh and different. Uh, and there's no shortage of haunted people or haunted places in this world. Um, and I say that as someone who doesn't believe in ghosts uh, at all. Um, but I, I do very much believe in the power that our past has over our present and how that shapes our future. Um, that's the kind of, of ghost that I believe in. Uh, and so, yeah, it'll, it'll always be something that fascinates me. Thank you so much if you watched this whole thing all the way through. I can't wait to hear your thoughts down below. Let me know what films you love of Mike's and also 
A huge thank you to Mike for doing this with me. It was such a pleasure. I can't wait to check out his projects that he's currently working on, Midnight Mass and Midnight Club. I am very excited to see what is coming. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to share it with a friend who you think might enjoy it, please do that as well. My name is Emma. I do spooky content talking about horror movies and thriller movies every single week. If you'd like to subscribe, I'd love to have you here. And I'll talk to you all very soon. Stay spooky. Bye friends.